try to bring the message. I can't do it. I'm the same as John does, and no doubt about that. But uh, um, let me find the first verse I want to do here this morning. Uh, and uh, Shoni has done a good job of getting the, and be getting the verses up there for us. Um, so. Uh, I'm going to start with a, a verse in Genesis, the 16th chapter, uh, and uh, I'll find it here in a minute. Uh, just about there. You know, Don has, uh, Don's got his electronic tablet, I guess is what you call it. Uh, I've got my old school tablet here. So <laughs> it, I don't think this is going to go... Uh, if I tried to use mine, it would go, uh, uh, the screen would go blank and I'd be lost. Um, so, uh, what I want to talk to you about this morning, I don't know, uh, Shoni, if you got that, uh, the title uh, up there. I want to talk to you about where have we come from, why are we here, and where are we going? Uh, I want to start out with um, a verse that kind of explains why I'm using this particular uh, passage here. Genesis 16, um, 7 and 8. Uh, and I'm going to expound on this verse a little bit more later on. But um, there's an example here of uh, I'm talking about kind of about God's timing and placing us uh, where we are at a certain time. Uh, and sometimes we have a tendency to get ahead of God's timing. We get anxious and we want to kind of move on our own. And that's exactly what Abraham had done uh, in uh, this passage. Uh, God had promised Abraham a son, a family, and that was going to be many, many generations uh, and many people, more people than they could even ever be able to count, as many as the sands on the seashore. Uh, but Abraham was getting up about 90 years old and Sarah at this time was about 80 years old and they didn't have that baby yet. And uh, so Sarah said to Abraham, she said, it doesn't look like I'm ever going to have a, ever have a baby for you, so why don't you take my uh, maidservant, have a baby by her. And uh, of course Abraham said, that's fine with me. So they did. They had a, uh, he took uh, uh, Hagar as his wife and had a son named Ishmael, but um, as um, after Hagar got pregnant, uh, Sarah was kind of jealous of her and was treating her bad, so Hagar kind of ran off out into the desert, and in verse um, 7, an angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was a spring that is beside the road to Shur, and he said to her, Hagar, servant of Sarah, where have you come from, and where are you going? And I think it could be implied, there could be another question right in the middle of that, and I don't think he would change the meaning of this text at all. He might have said, Hagar, servant of Sarah, where have you come from, why are you here, and where are you going? And that's what we're up this morning. I want to talk about where have we come from? Why are we here at this present time? And where are we going? Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is where have we come from? And let's use a passage in Genesis, the first Genesis 1 1, where it all began. And I love that book of Genesis. Here's where it all began Genesis 1 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's where it started. Genesis 1-1. God created the heavens and the earth. Then we turn over to um, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 31. After six days of creating the world, God looked down at the world that he had created. It says, verse 31, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. And we see that on the seventh day, God rested. Um, so we all came from that one beginning of the creation that God looked at and said, 
it is what I've created is very good, very good. And then, sadly to say, and I, as I understand it, there in the garden, God planted that garden in Eden with Adam and Eve there, and uh, with Eve as God's helpmate. It was there, and I understand that God came down into the garden kind of on a regular basis and visited with them, sat down and talked to them. But then in verse, uh, in chapter 3, verse 1 through 11, the fall of man. God had told them that there was one tree that they were not supposed to eat in that, uh, in that garden. Verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than all the animals that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say to you, You must not eat from the tree of the garden? The woman said to her servant, uh, To the serpent, We may eat from the trees, all the trees in the, in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat from the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat, uh, it your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. Then the eyes of the, uh, both of them, uh, she, she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some of the fruit of the tree and I ate it. So that was the first fall of man. The serpent, Satan, came and tempted them and they took that temptation. And after that we see that they were separated from God and God told them that they were going to die. I think he, and when he created them, that first man and woman, he intended for them to live forever. But they sinned, and they were separated from God, and taken out of the Garden of Eden. In another place, I want to read it, the uh, 20th chapter, 20th verse of that same chapter, telling us where we came from. Adam named his wife Eve, because she would be the mother of all the living. She would become the mother of all the living. We came from that humble beginning there in the, in the Garden of Eden, in the fall of man, and God told Eve that she would have to bear children, and uh, because of that, we know that God said, and God mandated it that all man, all mankind, would come to trace their heritage back to Eve in the Garden of Eden. So that's one of the first places we've come from. But I want to go through quickly some of the, uh, just kind of a history of the Old Testament and uh, talking about how it all kind of took place. So it was about from the beginning of, uh, in Genesis, the first chapter, up to um, the book of Malachi uh, in the time of Christ. There's about 4,000 years total in there. So I want to just real quickly uh, use my tablet here to uh, go through some of these things. And I'd encourage you to take some notes, maybe just write down some, I'm going to kind of hit real quickly on a lot of verses, a lot of chapters in the Bible that gives you, Genesis is so full of history of what of mankind, where we came from, and where we're going. Uh, and uh, if you want to just write down some of these verses, I'd encourage you to do that. And go home this week and study some of these verses. Uh, in Genesis uh, chapter 6, 7, and 8, and 9, we see the story of the flood. 
man had become, it didn't take very long for man to, it's, the thoughts were all evil thoughts. They were not seeking God, but God picked out one man, a man by the name of Noah, who was a righteous man. He says, says Noah, I'm going to send a flood on this earth. It's going to wipe out everybody but your own family. For 120 years, Noah was building that ark and preaching the gospel to other people, and nobody listened. Nobody listened to what he said until the rain started coming. When they got all the animals in the ark and God closed the door, and the rain started coming, and it kept falling and falling and falling for 40 days and 40 nights. It said the, the floodgates of the earth were opened up. The, the, I guess it was like springs just coming up out of the ground. It covered the whole face of the whole earth. And they were in that ark for almost a year. Then they came out from that ark. And Noah and his three sons and their wives, eight people all together. And that, that tells the whole story in Genesis 6, 7, 8, and 9. Then you think, well, maybe they had learned their lesson. But uh, uh, Noah's family started having kids and and grandkids and multiplying again, and then comes the Tower of Babel. And um, in Genesis, the 11th chapter, it talks about how all, all the people of the earth, they hadn't scattered out a whole lot yet. They were kind of staying in one place, and they were going to build a tower that was going to reach up into heaven, and they thought they were going to be able to kind of take the place of God. They were going to be able to do their own thing by having uh, uh, this Tower of Babel. And you know the story. God saw that and he said it wasn't good because man, you know, just to kind of do whatever they want to do. And so he scrambled, he gave a lot of them different languages. They get to work one morning and making these bricks and got piling them up there, making the tower. They get together one morning and all of a sudden they can't understand each other. It's kind of like me when I do my housing management down there at the dairy and everybody's Spanish and I get down there and I try to talk to them and I do my best. I, now I've got an electronic way of, of uh, communicating with it, but they didn't have that in the third tower of Babel. Uh, and, uh, so that's when man started to spread over all the earth and God, because God had uh, scrambled their language. Then we see, we come up to the, to the time of Abraham. Abraham was, the, was a very righteous man. God uh, kind of took a liking to Abraham because he was he was uh, following God's plan. And uh, actually, Abraham was living in a city where it was a very, somewhat like a modern city of Ur the Chaldees. Back then, I've, I've done some study, and, and I've heard studies I've done about the Ur the Chaldees. Even back then, they had figured out a way with uh, bamboo pipes to bring running water into their houses way back many years ago, but God came to Abraham and said, I want you to leave this place, this modern city. I want you to go to the land of Canaan. And he says, sometime I'm going to give you, give your family, your descendants, all that land. But from that time on, uh, Abraham was a nomad. Follow, and we see that in... Um, the call of Abraham in Genesis, the 12th chapter. And he became a nomad traveling for many years. And God had given him this promise that he would have a son and that he would have many, uh, many descendants, more than the sand of the sea. And then we see that passage there in Genesis the 16, uh, 16, 1 through 8, that says, uh, that tells where Hagar had got, uh, Abraham got ahead of God. He would have had, had a baby by his uh, wife's servant. And uh, Sarah ran that slave girl off. And that's where the, uh, where the angel found her and said, where are you going? Where, where have you come from? Why are you here, basically? And where are you going? And still... Abraham later, uh, God uh, still, God still blesses Abraham after he made that big mistake. And when Isaac uh, was born, 
uh, Abraham's son Isaac was born when uh, Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 90 years old, way behind, beyond the, uh, the time of child, uh, being able to have babies. But God had promised, God keep, always keeps his promises. And he promised that son. And finally, when Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 90, they finally had that baby uh, that, that they named Isaac. And that's in, found in verse um, in G at Genesis the twenty first chapter, and then in Genesis the twenty second chapter, Abraham God wanted to test Abraham just a little bit to just see how faithful he was. So here Abraham now about, it's about twelve years later from what I understand. God says, Abraham, I want you to take that one son that I've given you. I want you to take him up on the mountain and sacrifice him. Abraham knew that some way or another God was going to provide for him. That's how faithful he was. And this is in Genesis 22. Abraham and his servant, and they take the little 12 year old Isaac, they go up, on, start up on the mountain to do the sacrifice. And Isaac knows enough about sacrifices to know what's, in, what's going on and that they're going up to sacrifice. And he asks his dad, he says, in, in, Isaac was carrying the wood for the fire and uh, Isaac asked his dad well now he says we've got the fire we've got everything else for the sacrifice but we don't have the lamb and Abraham said God will provide the sacrifice they get up there and Abraham builds a little altar and, and uh, lays his one and only son or his, his one son uh, Isaac on that altar gets ready to make the sacrifice and the angel of the Lord stops his hand from bringing the knife down on his son and Abraham looks over and there's a lamb caught in the bushes. God provided. God could see that Abraham really believed that he would take care of him. Then we get on in Genesis the 24th chapter. Here Isaac's grown up and his mother has passed away and Abraham doesn't want to get his uh, son a, a wife from among the people as they're living as nomads and he sends his servant back to uh, their homeland to get a wife and this is in Genesis 24 the story of Isaac and Rebekah and it's, it's quite a miraculous story there and I won't get into it but I encourage you to go ahead and look up Genesis 24 and read that and then Isaac and Rebekah get married. And then they have two sons. They have twin sons, Jacob and Esau. And then as Jacob grows up, Esau is kind of put out. And he kind of sells his, his birthright. Esau is the oldest one, but he sells his birthright to uh, uh, Jacob because he comes in from the field one day and there's food on the table and he's starved to death. And he says, I'll give you my birthright if you'll give me something to eat. But he said, I'm going to starve to death anyway. So that's how it happened. And Jacob ended up having 12 sons, who we all know as the patriarchs that God spoke to many times. And Joseph was kind of uh, the favorite son because there were, uh, Isaac actually had, uh, Jacob had uh, his wife Leah and her maidservant and uh, his wife uh, Ra uh, Rachel. And her maid servant, he had ended up having 12 sons, two of the patriarchs. Joseph is his favorite one. He's the youngest one because he's from uh, uh, Rachel, who is a, uh, Jacob's favorite wife. And he makes Joseph a coat of, as we know it, as a coat of many colors, an ornamented coat. And he sends Jacob out one day to the, to the field where, the, where his brothers are taking care of the sheep. And as you know the story, I uh, hope you know the story of how that uh, those, uh, those brothers of Joseph were angry with, because he was the favorite son. They took his coat and soaked it in blood and they sold him. They were going to kill him, but his older brother Reuben talked him out of that. There was a help to be a caravan coming through, headed to Egypt. They sold Joseph into slavery to send him into Egypt. 
Joseph had had some dreams that he, his sons, uh, his brothers, and his dad were going to bow down to him someday. And he didn't understand those dreams and his brothers. That's one reason they were kind of angry with him because he was, was telling them that he was going to be above them someday. So they sold him into slavery in Egypt. And there were good times. He went into Potiphar's house and he was in Egypt. He was bought by a very wealthy uh, man who was in control, part of the control of the country. And he had some good years, real good years there until Potiphar's wife wanted him to go to bed with her and he refused because he knew that was not God's uh, but she kind of tricked other people into making think that Joseph had uh, had tried to uh, seduce her, and so he's thrown into prison. And then he interpreted some dreams for some people that were in the prison. And a few years later, they remembered what he had said to the king, and the king had a had a vision in the night. He didn't know what was happening. What the dream about the, the six good cows, the seven good cows and the seven bad cows, the seven good heads of grain and the seven uh, bad heads of grain. So Pharaoh found out that Joseph was in the prison, but that he could interpret dreams. And he brought Joseph out. And Joseph interpreted the dreams, said there's going to be seven years of plenty in food in this country, in this land, and then there's going to be seven years of famine. And so Pharaoh put, uh, put Joseph in command of all the, all the crops and, and they brought, uh, had other people bring the crops in, a certain portion of the crops in, the, in the storage in there in, in Egypt. And after uh, that, after that, this good seven years and there were seven years of famine and people from all over the world started coming to Joseph to get food. And lo and behold, somebody that he knew pretty well, showed up. His brothers showed up to be, buy food. Their dad had told him, you know, let's just go, I need to send you to Egypt. I hear there's food there. We need food for our family. He sent them there. And immediately Joseph realized, he recognized his, uh, his brothers. He, and they did not recognize him. They did not expect that they were ever going to see him again. So they, he sent them back home. He asked them some questions, some uh, leading questions, and he knew exactly who they were, and um, then they were sent back after that food was gone, they were sent back again, and Abraham sent them back, uh, uh, Jacob sent them back again, and they said, we can't go, because we've got to take our younger son, and they finally talked him into letting them take their younger son. When they got there that time, um, when they went for food the second time, um, we see that Joseph uh, revealed himself to them. And I want to read a, a passage here um, that uh, talks about, uh, let's do the, have you got that uh, Genesis 45, 1 through 8? Let me get that one here. And the brothers come, and Joseph recognizes them, and he sees his younger brother, and he just, he got so emotional, he couldn't contain himself. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before, before all his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one, Joseph, when he made himself known to his brothers, and he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard, heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. They sold, sold him into slavery. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they, come, uh, when they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now you do not... Uh, do not be angry with yourself for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there's been uh, famine in the land and for, for the next five years, there'll be more, no plowing or reaping. But God sent me ahead of you 
to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. All in God's timing. All, all in God's timing. And he sent Joseph there, and Joseph realized it, and he uh, told his brothers, don't be afraid of me, even though you did sell me a slave. It was God's doing, not yours. Then we see that Joseph invited his father and all his brothers to move over to Egypt where there would be plenty of food. And then we see a time of about 400 years in this biblical history. There's 400 years that the Israelites uh, lived in the land of Egypt. And then we see the story of Moses, a new Pharaoh who after many generations had come along. He did not remember about Joseph and the promises that that Pharaoh had made to, uh, to Joseph about having his family there. And he was very impressive to the Israelites after these 400 years. Then we see the story of Moses, how Moses was born. And, you know, in, in that time, the, uh, the Pharaoh had told the, uh, he, he wanted to get rid of all the, the Jewish Israelite kids. So he told them to kill all the baby boys. We see the story of Mo uh, Moses, how he was uh, put in a basket. I heard the story the other day, Matt, uh, Moses was a basket case. Uh, so, um, and that's kind of he was. He put in the basket, and, and Pharaoh's daughter saw him and brought him up out of the ba out of the basket and raised him till he was forty years old. Then he got got up a scuffle with some of the uh, Egyptians and killed one Egyptian. And then uh, he thought he thought he was just uh, doing it to save his own nation. Some of those Jewish people had also seen the same thing and and uh, got in a fight and and they asked Mo and Moses was going to save him from that. And he says, um, you know, they say, and he runs off because he's afraid he's going to be killed. He runs off for 40 years, and then he sees a burning bush in the desert. And God, he walks over to see that bush, and God speaking to him says, it's time for my people to leave Egypt. They're so oppressed. He says, I see what they're going through. They need to be out of there. I need you to go back. God put Moses in at the right time to be there, uh, to lead the people out of, out of uh, Egypt. And then we see the exodus from Egypt and all the, the um, so go back and study those in the book of uh, uh, Genesis, the plagues that God used to eventually lead his people out of that. And they got, it didn't take very long, and Don been talking about that some in his, uh, in his series, his sermon series, about how they, in the desert, they got almost to the land of Canaan, or the promised land. They sent out the 12 spies. The 12 spies came back to them. Uh, Caleb and Joshua said, we can take it. God's with us. We can take that country. But the other 10 said, we can't do it. They're too big. It's, they're big giants. We can't do it. And so the people, the Israelite people decided, well, we're not going in right now. And that's where God, Don was talking about the Kadesh Barnea, Barnea, however you pronounce it, that it was their turning point. They could either go forward or they could go backwards, which they did. For 40 years, they wandered in that desert, 40 years, until the oldest one of those people was dead. And then the younger generation was able to go in and take the nation, take the, the from the Canaanites, you see when they crossed the Jordan River and took over, took Jericho and then, then spread out through the whole land. They took it. And then we see the Mosaic laws that, Mo, that Moses had given to the people. It was laws that of sacrifice, many. It just, it's just, if you read there again in, in Genesis, all the animal sacrifices that were made when people had sins. They made those animal sacrifices that could not really take away these, their sins. They just kind of rolled them ahead until the day of Christ. But um, they were, there was laws that they really couldn't keep. They had judges, and they had prophets, and they had kings. But none of those could really do what the people wanted them to do. The Israelites had ups and downs. They followed God real closely for for a few years, and then when that judge or prophet or, or priest uh, or king would die off and somebody else would take over and wouldn't be quite such a good leader, they'd go down and they had roller coaster rides over and over again. 
And I thought about that. You know, I thought, well, here they're cho God's chosen people, and yet they do wrong and then they do right. And they do wrong and they do right. I thought, how could God's chosen people do that? And I got to thinking, I do that on a daily basis. It's kind of like a roller coaster ride. I do things that, I, that should not be done. I have to ask God's forgiveness, and I'm kind of on a high again. And before I know it, I'm doing things up and down. But that's the way God's people were. And they were taken, because they didn't follow God's plan, they were taken into captivity in, uh, into Babylon for many years. And then there's a remnant that returns many years later. And then, just in our Bible history, we have about 400 years of silence in the Bible. It just doesn't say a whole lot about what was going on. But we do know from uh, New Testament history that the Roman Empire had kind of taken control of the Israelites. And they were hoping for a savior, and somebody to come and be their king. There were so many uh, prophecies, over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament about a king that was going to be coming, and they understood that it was going to be an earthly kingdom. What they did not realize that it was going to be a heavenly kingdom that God, Jesus uh, Christ was going to take over. But after those 400 years of silence, with the Roman Empire taking control, they were looking for a savior. Christ is born. He lived a perfect life, and he died on the cross. And then we see the resurrection. And just kind of, I'm just trying to do a brief history of what's going on here. Christ was born, and there's a passage that says, um, and, then, and then after Christ was born, he died on the cross, and he was resurrected, and he rose back into heaven, and he had told his people, his followers, his disciples, he says to his apostles, he says, wait here in Jerusalem, I'm going to send somebody to give you the answer, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, is wait here, and on the day of Pentecost, which is just about three or four weeks later, was the day, was when Peter preached his first sermon, and I want to, uh, and that was the day that the New Testament church was started. And let's read uh, Acts 22, Acts the 22nd chapter. I mean, Acts the second chapter, I'm sorry, showing him going back there, what is he doing? <laughs> oh, Acts the second chapter. Verse 29 through 41. This is the first gospel sermon that was ever preached after Christ and, that, and the day that the church was established. And Peter speaking here, he says, Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here today with us. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on an oath that he would put, uh, replace one of his descendants on the throne, on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was not ab abandoned to the grave, nor did his body decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of that fact. Exalted uh, to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now know, uh, now, know, now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, here's the important part, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to their heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He promises for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all who the Lord God will call. With many other, with many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and that about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So here's where we've come from. This is where we've come from. The Old Testament history, we've come from Christ. When Christ is born and, and dies and is resurrected, and the church is started. That's our Old Testament and New Testament history. That's where we've come from.
And then we ask the question, why are we here at this time? We look back at um, that passage in uh, Genesis where uh, Joseph, in verse 45 through 8, uh, where Joseph tells his brothers, you know, they're scared of him. They're scared because they know that he has the power over them, that he can take their lives. But he says, don't blame yourselves. God's the one that put me here at the right time to save our nation, to save our family, to save our nation. So we're here because God has put us here at the right time. I want to look also at the book of Esther, the fourth chapter. And a little background about this. Esther, uh, we're, we're here in the, the kingdom of the uh, Medes and Persians. And uh, Esther comes, uh, is a Jewish, young Jewish lady. And she comes in to be the queen of Medes and Persia, a very important position. But the trouble is that the king, there's laws there that nobody can go in and see the king unless they have been invited in. And as the story plays out, and I'd like to have you read the book of Esther. It's a very important, very, it's a kind of a fun book to read. Uh, that uh, there's a man that does not like the Jewish people. He's mad at the Jewish people. So he goes to the king and asks him to to set a date when all the Jews in all the land were going to be killed on a particular day. Esther's uncle Mordecai heard about this, and he sent word to Esther in the uh, in the place where, where uh, the kings and queens went, in the temples, uh, in the palaces, I should say. And Esther sends back the word. He says, you need to go and tell uh, the king that... Uh, it's our people that are about to die. And Esther says, you know, I can't go in. She says, I haven't been invited into his uh, place for, for 30 days. She says, if I go in, I could be killed. If he does not uh, like seeing me there, he can, he can just have me put to death. And that's when uh, Mordecai I sent back word for, with her. Verse, uh, chapter 4, Esther 4, verse 12. Verse uh, when Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's uh, family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. He says, you may have been put in this place at this time for just this purpose right here. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, go gather together all the Jews who are in, in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai, I convinced Esther that she was placed there for that purpose, that very purpose. And I believe that God put us here at the right time. And who knows? We never know how one of God is using us at the right place at the right time. Something that we might say or do can sure make a lot of difference in individuals' lives and whether they go to uh, go to heaven or not. But we, some of us, by what we do, some of us sitting right here, by some of the things we do, might change the whole history of this country and this world. God put us here. God's timing is always perfect. And uh, I want to read Romans of, and just show you how perfect God's timing is. Romans, um, the fifth chapter, verse 6. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. God knows the timing of this world, and he knew, he said, that just 
the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. He died for us. He put Christ here in a particular time, and people did not want to accept him. And this guy might be the same way. People may not want to accept us, but God put us here for a reason. For, for one reason, he gave us everyone a purpose from the time we were conceived. He gave it, he had a plan for each one of us. And we don't know exactly. We can't, we, uh, I think probably when we get to heaven, God might say, you know what? That little incident in your life that maybe you didn't like, but that changed history. God put us here at the right time for the right reason. So that's, that's where we, why we are here now. And then the last question I want to answer is, where are we going? That's the most important question. You know, we can see where we've been. We can see why we are here now. But all that makes a little difference unless it changes the way that we're, of where we're going. I want to read Revelation, the 22nd chapter. very end of Revelation, we see that God's people, God's team is going to win. Verse 22, verse 12 through 14. Behold, here's Christ speaking. He says, Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gate into the city. He's talking about the city of heaven. Those, that's where we want to be headed. That's where we're going. And I want to finish up with one last verse, John 14. Verse 1 through 4. God is on our side. Christ is on our side. He put all that history in place. He put us here at the right time. And he died at the right time. He rose at the right time. He went back to heaven at the right time. In verse four, in chapter 14, verse 1, he says, Christ is speaking again. He says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way, the place where I'm going. He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I will come back. And that's where we want to be going. We see where we've come from. We see why we're here now, and we see where we want to go. It's a very comforting thought, but to know that as long as we are in Christ Jesus, we have, he's coming back. And I, you know, I've thought so many times that, about he's going 2,000 years ago. It's been 2,000 years since he died on the cross and rose and went back into heaven. And he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. He's been doing that for 2,000 years. If he built this, he, if God and Christ created this world in six days, Wonderful, wonderful world that I enjoy. I can live forever right where I'm living now and enjoy it. But I know it's a beautiful place. But if God, Christ has been there for 2,000 years, preparing a place for us. What? Wow, what a wonderful place in 2,000 years that he's been getting ready for us. So, coming from that Bible history, Old Testament history, the, the laws that were so hard that people could not keep them, that's where we came from. Mm -hmm. We came from where the church was started. God put us here at the right time. The Christ is gone to prepare a place for us. That's where we're going. So be comforted in that, with that message today, with that thought in mind. We know who wins in the long run. We know we can know where we're going if we're in Christ Jesus. Father, wow. It's interesting to go back through Genesis and the Old Testament and realize 
what a tough life those guys had. Those people had, and you know, laws that they had hard, hard time keeping, and and uh, but but you intended for them to keep them, and there's ups and downs. They had roller coaster rides in their lives, in the na lives of the nation. To get you all to through. We know God in our own lives. We have roller coaster rides. We have ups and downs, and and uh, you pick us up where we are at the right time, and you give us the hope of eternal life. We know that your son, Jesus, has gone there to prepare a place for us. We thank you for that. We thank you for the hope of where we're going. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.